Hi, this is Meg Riley. Couple more days in Mexico City where I have had just fallen in love with this place and I'm excited to go home. When I left, there were two feet of snow in my garden and now I will be digging the mulch off of everything. So I'm excited to go home too. Christina, welcome back. Thank you. It feels good to be back. I appreciate I appreciate y'all so much when, when I'm not here because I can go back and see you on the podcast and on the video. So that's awesome. But I'm really happy to be back with you all. And I am in Charlottesville, Virginia. And all is well with your health? I'm doing better, getting better every day. So appreciate it. Great. Michael. Good morning, everyone. This is Michael Tino here in Peekskill, New York. Um, we're in a different room in my house today because uh, we have house guests who are living in my office because that's also our guest room because I have a small house. But the ancestors are literally behind me here, which is wonderful. That's my grandmother on the wall that you see. Um, so it's good to be with you. And Jessica. Hi, Jessica Star Rockers. I'm um, on Bainbridge Island just off of Seattle and I'm um, I'm still waking up. I'm still figuring out Facebook Live. <laughs> um, you know, it's hard to do at eight in the morning to figure out new technology. So, um, but I'm super happy to be here and uh, excited to talk about this book, which I've been reading as I prepare for the MFC because it's, even though it just came out, it's already on the MFC list. So um, yeah, I'm excited to do some studying here while and talk with you guys in prep. <laughs> So as Jessica has alluded to, we have the two co-authors and one of the contributors to um, the two co-editors and a contributing author to a brand new hot off the presses book called Justice on Earth, People of Faith Working at the Intersections of Race, Class, and the Environment. And I'll introduce them in just a minute. I do want to just acknowledge another beloved who has gone to the ancestors this week, uh, Lee Scouty Wright beloved by many of us. Um, many of us met her when she was very young because her mom, Nanine Gowdy, is a UU minister who was on the board at that time. And so all the board members knew Elise. She, I got to know her well. She spent a year in the Washington office. Uh, she was bubbly, vivacious, falling in love, coming out, loving life, a fierce advocate for justice, beautiful, just an amazing life force, young black woman, died at 43 and leaves a three-year-old son. Tragically, I believe we can all say we hate cancer. And that also, this is our second young black UU woman leader uh, in her 40s that we've lost this month. And cancer does hit black women much more often and younger. And that's part of the intersectionality that we're talking about today, actually. Michael, I know you also knew Elise well. I did. Elise and I um, served on the, the teen staff together at the Southeast UU Summer Institute, SUSE. And I'm, I'm thinking that's now 20 years ago that we did that. So we were both in, in our 20s and the world, the world was ahead of us um, when that happened. And so it's uh, shocking. I know that she... Uh, had breast cancer and I thought that she was past it and to learn that it recurred so virulently that um, it took her life is really uh, heartbreaking. Yeah, I don't know if anybody else wants to say a word about her. She, she had cancer four times, she had four, four rounds of cancer. So I too, you know, I hadn't seen her in a while and it, it totally socked me in the solar plexus. I had no idea that she was that ill. And um, so, yeah, yeah. So that's a sobering reality as we, and there are many, many other sobering realities as we talk about this topic today of the intersections of racism, classism and the environment. So let's introduce our speakers right away. We have Jennifer Nordstrom, the senior minister of the First Unitarian Society of Milwaukee, who's one of um, the co-editors. And we have Manish Mishra Marzetti, who is, now oh, this is going to be exciting to say, Senior Minister of the First Parish in Lincoln, Massachusetts, and soon to be Senior Minister of the First Unitarian Universalist Congregation of Ann Arbor, yay! And also currently a trustee on the National UUA Board. 
And we're also joined by um, Peggy Clark. Peggy's a contributing author to the book. She's been a guest on The View before, and she is a local environmentalist and food justice organizer in Westchester, New York, and the minister at First Unitarian Society of Westchester in Hastings. So welcome to all of you. And, and let's just start. I'm curious, Manish and Jennifer, what, what got you writing, what got you creating this book? Manish, you wanna start? Thank you, uh, Meg, I'm happy to. So Jennifer and I met um, in 2014 at uh, an event that was called the Collaboratory, um, a kind of a made up and interesting word. It was meant to capture the notion of collaboration and the creativity of a lab, a laboratory. And uh, it was convened by the UU Ministry for the Earth in Detroit. And uh, the idea was to bring together people who might not normally work together on justice issues and help them not just begin building relationship and begin talking to one another, but begin developing a little bit of a different level of analysis, a different lens on how um, all the various justice work that these individuals and groups were working on could be deeply intertwined and linked and then begin to kind of step into the reality that if we all actually join together in our efforts that we could be even more impactful than we could be um, on our own or working only in single issue groups. And it was a power, powerful experience, Meg. Um, you know, I've, I've been in Unitarian Universalism about 20 years, maybe a little bit more than that. And um, a lot of my justice work has revolved around um, a couple of core issues, gay and lesbian uh, rights and equality, uh, transgender equality, um, and racial justice. And uh, in that 20 year period, you know, a lot of good has happened working on those, within those tracks, and then building allies who come in and help you within those tracks. And one of the things that was a real eye opener for me was how um, some of the deeper rooted, more endemic issues in our society cannot really be addressed in a single issue track. You need to build large coalitions, you need to develop an intersectional analysis. And that experience in 2014, I didn't have that lens. I didn't have that analysis until I had this experience that the UUMFE board had helped create. And it was, it was transformative. It was absolutely um, life-changing for me. I, I was very grateful that I had got to have that opportunity. And that inspired this, that, that led to, my gosh, this was so life-altering and transformative for me. I wanna find a way to help people um, step into that lens and see the power that we can harness through intersectionality. Thanks, Vinish. And I, I think we actually did a show after the collaboratory and had some of the people who were there. I think Kat Lou was there, right? Yeah, I, yeah, it was, it was exciting to hear about them. And Jennifer, you've also been here before talking about your earth-based spirituality and how that ties to earth justice. So tell me what the conversation with Manish opened up for you. Well, um, I, I have been working in environmental justice um, from before I became a minister. Uh, prior to becoming a minister, um, I did work on nuclear disarmament and climate change. And my conversion story happened um, in uh, the, the foothills around Los Alamos National Labs where a group of indigenous and Chicano youth um, helped me understand the connections between race, class, and the environment. And working with Manish has been eye-opening for me to understand more clearly what the UU world has been, the faith-based world trying to work on these issues um, in silos, and then um, what opportunities are available from trying to connect some of those silos and um, build fusion coalitions and um, broad-based coalitions together and um, how we can do that from our Unitarian Universalist faith grounding. Were there surprises in, um, in gathering the pieces in the book or what, what stood out as you started to, to gather the pieces? Absences, voices you hadn't known about that were doing great work? I'm, I'm curious what, what came to you? You know, we put out um, 
we put out a call, a broad call to folks asking for essays that would make these connections, would um, investigate uh, where there are these intersectionalities and also asking people to tell us their case studies of how they've been doing this work as Unitarian Universalists. And we knew a lot of the folks from the collaboratory um, and knew some of the work that they were doing. Um, but I, I remember we got a, a couple of surprises um, and one of them is in the book. Um, and it's uh, the, the chapter about the folks, the Unitarian Universalist congregation in Bellingham um, that's working with the Lummi Nation, um, which the UU world learned about um, at General Assembly, but we got the chapter, the essay uh, about six months before that. <laughs> um, and so I remember uh, just being so impressed with the way that the congregation was following the leadership of the Lummi Nation um, and really uh, learning how to build collaborative relationships of support and solidarity um, rather than trying to lead themselves. I'm curious, Manisha, if you've had surprises in, in the process. Yeah, uh, thank you, Jennifer. Uh, you know, one of the things that was interesting to me, um, you know, the construction of our identities and the histories and ancestors we are connected to is often a work in progress. It's not just a given that you kind of arrive and just have all of that. And, and so, you know, doing this work um, helped me um, have a sense of, the, of, of grounding in people of color movements that the histories of and trajectories of which I did not know as deeply until I until we stepped into this work together. And so, for example, there, some of the other contributing authors of the book include Paula Cole Jones, who's been involved in the uh, in the work of environmental justice and the intersections of um, racial justice and environmental justice for a long time. Um, Mel Hoover as well, and that was really rich for me. You know, I, I think one of the things that deepened. The experience in Detroit that led to this book was profound in and of itself. Um, you know, I share in, in the book one of the things that, that you cannot forget when it's a it's a personal experience that you've had. You know, being in the parking lot of an elementary school, the, the kids of whom are almost like 98 90, or more percent African American and Latino, um, and seeing and situated right next door an incinerator that is spewing fumes into the environment and the garbage truck from Gross Point, Michigan, one of the wealthier communities of Michigan, pulling into the incinerator facility. I mean, the connections and the direct impacts on um, where that is situated, who is impacted by that is so clear. So all of that, I mean, it was a journey into my, not just my own identity, but the history of the people of color community in the United States, pieces of which that I did not have. And, um, and one of the things that, you know, uh, we heard people say over and over again is that if you are a person of color living on, in these circumstances, you can't you can't ignore that history. You can't you can't not be a part of it because you're living it. You're living next to that incinerator. You're living next to the waste treatment facility, whatever it might be. So it also highlighted privilege that there's this, not knowing these pieces of reality in American society. There's there's privilege connected with that, and you know. Um, I had to step out of some of my own, you know, middle class privilege to to learn more about the experience of communities of color in our nation and um, how deeply I wound up feeling I cared about all of that. Can I ask um, the, that collaboratory seems like such a um, important piece of this book. I mean, it, it's actually a thread people's experiences with that is a thread that sort of runs through several of the essays and how that inspired them. And I'm just curious about, you know, how it is to have those immersion experiences. And, and, um, and I know this is talked about a little bit in the book too, how, how like a congregation might have one of those immersion experiences in a responsible way. And um, so I'm interested to hear um, what felt so good about that experience in particular? Um, so I wouldn't use the word good. I mean, it was it was an educational and eye-opening, a deeply meaningful experience. And the things we were witnessing were 
um, moving and hard and painful. Um, we do within Unitarian Universalism have um, kind of structured opportunities. For, so this is called experiential learning. And we do have structured opportunities within um, Unitarian Universalism for this kind of travel-based or experience-based um, learning where you are in authentic relationship with impacted communities and are going as um, friends, allies, people in relationship to both stand in solidarity and learn firsthand what is going on. Um, Kathleen McTeague is one of the contributing authors in the book and the UU College of Social Justice um, creates these types of opportunities on the Arizona uh, Mexico border related to justice, um, uh, border justice issues. They've also started a new program in Nicaragua that um, creates that type of, um, uh, you, uh, you could say, accountable, um, relational, experiential learning um, opportunity with impacted communities in Nicaragua around climate justice, for example, or um, the women's movement in Nicaragua is also an example, uh, an opportunity that they offer. The experience we had in Detroit. Um, I'm not aware of UU opportunities that replicate that. I do know that the U, which is unfortunate. I mean, it would be actually, I think, very useful if we, if we did, because it's 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 so impactful, and that what what has happened in Detroit is replicated throughout the American landscape. Um, it, it might be something that at some point in time, a group of folks might want to cultivate. I know that this upcoming General Assembly, the UU Ministry for the Earth, is creating um, a a slot, an experiential learning slot. It's like, a, I think, a two-hour experience in Kansas City to learn about how um, environment class and class issues impact the Latino com uh, community in Kansas City. So they are creating, you, Ministry for the Earth, is creating um, a, a taste, a mini, a mini opportunity uh, during General Assembly. And one of the things that I noticed during uh, the process of the book is, is that the theme that came up again and again from all of the case studies was um, that it's about being in relationship. Um, so I know Manish said relational opportunities, but I think if you read the different case studies, um, what you're what you'll read about is Unitarian Universalist congregations that have gotten into deep relationship with um, communities that have been directly affected by the intersections of race, class, and the environment. Um, and that that relationship is what allows the learning to happen in, um, in a healthy and accountable way, what, rather than in a sort of tourism or objectification way. Um, and, and the relationships are not just where the learning happens, it's where the transformation happens. It's where the opportunity is for change. So um, I was really moved by a lot of our authors and es uh, essayists um, involved in those relationships. And I think that um, that's what has changed me in my life as well, has, has been in deep relationship with people who have been directly affected by environmental racism. And that, that too, that idea of not being siloed, I think, you know, not just in um, your justice efforts, but just in your communities, you know, I think is um, important. I think it's especially important as so many of our congregations are um, focused on racial justice. Um, a lot of times I know in our, in our congregations, when we have that focus, we get other groups even within our congregation saying, but, you know, what about environmental justice? What about women's rights? What about, you know, does this mean that we can't do those things? Are you saying that this is the only thing that we can focus on? And up until up until th this book, really, um, I, I mean, I know there's other ways, but really it felt like such an opportunity to be able to show folks like here's a resource that you can now have, I can order for you <laughs> at UUA.org that talks about that very um, fear, you know, that folks have. And it's a really, it's a, it's a big fear, especially as they see resources maybe shifting um, within congregations and within um, our association of, you know, saying, you know, when we're working on racial justice, we're working on, um, you know, women's rights. We're working on LGBTQ rights. We're working on environmental justice. 
um, though the intersectionality of those you can't separate. And so what I was really appreciative of, of you all um, taking the time to put this together, because I know um, in many ways, um, gathering together an anthology or, or editing um, a bunch of authors uh, can be <laughs> even more challenging than writing your own, right? Um, the, the hurting the cats metaphor comes, comes to real life. Um, so what, what I really appreciated about this is, is the resource to the congregations now to be able to say, um, you know, here's, here's some real world examples within Unitarian Universalism, right? Um, where this makes a difference. Um, and so I'm, I'm wondering, as with my religious educator hat on, of course, um, you know, if there's any thought to, um, like kind of a study guide material or, you know, something along those lines of being able to use this, at, um, to take folks through, you know, just several sessions of, of a journey of looking at intersectionality. Now that you're all done. Um, I can speak to that. And Christina, I wanted to I wanted to thank you for your observation. I think that for me, and I, I think for Jennifer as well, that, th th that was a major motivating reason for wanting to put this book together, just experiencing firsthand over and over again in our congregations, which are a basic organizing unit of Unitarian Universalism, this kind of zero sum thinking, which is that, you know, if the minister or the staff person is showing up for um, the affordable housing thing, why aren't they at the women's march? Uh, or if if we direct congregational funding or financial support for racial justice, what about our LGBT work? Over and over and over again, this zero sum thinking, which it, I, I think in the current era, now now, I'm also, a lot, you know, as, as we all are, we're longtime activists. That siloed thinking has gotten us pretty far. I mean, you know, we have made a lot of progress in a lot of ways. So it's not that that strategy was a total failure, but we're at a point in our nation's history where that cannot be our only lens anymore. And, and in fact, the most intractable problems we are facing absolutely are intersectional. And until we find ways to begin coming together and getting out of the zero sum thinking and seeing that we all need to come together to work on the most intractable endemic problems, we're not gonna be effective on those intractable endemic problems. And so thank you, because that, that is absolutely the passion. I'm sure that's coming across in what I'm sharing now. Um, so our, our editor uh, in chief at Skinner House Books is brilliant, Mary Bernard. She's just lovely. And uh, Skinner House had encouraged us to include um, uh, resource and study material in the book itself. So at the end of every contributing chapter, there are um, study and reflection questions that, that form the basis of work that could happen in an adult education class. So it is built in. Um, it is built into the book already, and we hope people will take advantage of it. I think that, that yeah, one, oh, Meg, go on. My, Meg's finger. I just know Jennifer <laughs> has to leave soon and I want to give her a chance before she does. Jennifer is going to be attending an ICE hearing and, and needs to leave early. So I think you need to leave in just a few minutes. So I wanted to give you one last moment and then Michael will turn to you. Yeah, speaking of intersectional issues and needing to show up. Um, so I, I uh, want to just um, put an exclamation part point on what Christina and Manish both just said. Um, in, in our congregation here in Milwaukee, um, our Earth Justice Ministry is um, really taking that understanding on that these issues are all connected. And um, in Milwaukee, we actually, there are neighborhoods in Milwaukee that have higher rates of children with lead poisoning than the rates that you see in Flint, Michigan. Um, and so our Earth Justice Ministry here in Milwaukee is saying this is where environmental racism intersects with water issues and we're going to focus on um, lead pipes, uh, lateral pipes here in Milwaukee. Um, and I think that that is one of the ways that our congregation has begun to understand the intersectionality of these issues and is moving forward, um, creating relationships and coalitions. Um, I, I don't think in this day and age, in the current political environment, in the threats that we're facing um, from climate change, uh, from mass deportations, from police killings, 
I don't think we're going to be able to survive without creating fusion coalitions, without um, working together, without understanding the ways that all of these issues intersect. And so I'm really grateful um, to, for, to my co-editor, Manish, um, to all of you for getting it and for working on it and for moving with Unitarian Universalism um, to create these kinds of broad-based alliances that understand the ways that the issues connect with one another and that we just, we can't pull them apart. Um, we won't make it if we do. Um, so thank you all for your work and thank you for your understanding that I have to go to this ICE hearing. <laughs> we, we will be with you there. Thank you for doing that, that important witness as well. Thank you. Thank you. Michael, sorry. sorry to no, quite all right. I so appreciate uh, giving Jennifer the opportunity for some final reflections before she needed to leave. What I was going to say is that in, in my experience and, and work, the more we actually do real relational work, like real accountable relational work, the more intersectional things get just naturally. Um, you know, and I think about, so for example, um, you know, I've gone with youth in, in the congregation I served in New Orleans to volunteer there. And, you know, if you're, if you're going to do that right, it has to be in relationship with, with communities of color and poor communities in New Orleans. And it has to be combined with anti-racism education. And when you do that, what you wind up seeing is environment, the environmental racism in New Orleans, right? You wind up seeing the ways in which where people live um, are, are a function of, of the white supremacy culture um, in, our, in our country, right? And, um, you know, where, uh, the environmental degradation in where people live uh, tracks with with race. Right? Here in the city that I live in, in Peekskill, which is um, about 40% black and about 20% Latino, um, so you can do the math uh, math there. Uh, you know, if if you're in actual relationship with communities of color, you see the waste incinerator where all of the garbage in Westchester County gets burned. Uh, that was cited in Peekskill, um, which is, is far far more people of color than most of the county that we live in. And you see the fact that the pipeline carrying fracked natural gas from Pennsylvania to be exported in Massachusetts uh, goes through communities of color under the nuclear power plant, where if it exploded, would obliterate a community of color uh, here in Peekskill. I mean, and you, you can't not see those things if you're actually in a relationship. You can't not see the intersection. So it's just, it's exciting to me that this book explores where Unitarian Universalists are seeing those intersections and, and showing up at those intersections um, in, in accountable relational ways. So that's, that, that was just what I wanted to reflect on. And maybe, uh, maybe we can bring Peggy in now that, uh, now that Jennifer is gone, because I Peggy is serving as Jennifer's understudy today, so she's now fully in. Um, so I know Peggy pretty well. Um, Peggy's backyard is about six miles from my house in that direction, so um, so I know that the work that she's doing here. Maybe Peggy, you want to talk a little bit about what you wrote about in the book? Uh. Sure. I mean, I, I wrote, uh, I co-authored one chapter and then wrote a second. This conversation about relationship, it, you know, it matters in a, in a whole lot of ways. One of them is that, that authentic work only comes out of relationship. Authentic uh, ministry is relational. So whether that's done in a congregation or that's done in community, you know, that's where it has to happen. Um, but it's also true for community organizing. If you just need to make something happen. So I'm thinking about that pipeline you're talking about and to just walk into a neighborhood and say, 
I know this, by the way, firsthand experience, walking into a neighborhood and saying, there's a pipeline coming and it's coming through your neighborhood and this shouldn't happen and you all need to do something. And they were like, we don't know exactly who you are. So, you know, if the sky is falling, tell us about it later. Until I started building relationships, like, hey, I'm a mom who lives right over there and my kid knows your kid and let's have coffee and, and building up real trust relationships, which to be honest, it's taking more time than maybe, you know, the pipeline is getting closer and closer. But it, in the meantime, real work can happen that way. Um, I, I also wanted to say that, that the uh, environmental justice tour that Manish was talking about was so powerful for, for some of the people, clearly Manish. Um, and we have really talked about trying to do it again we, we really, it was transformative. And the idea of more people being able to just, you know, the first time I did the EJ tour was in New Jersey and I had the same experience that Manish had of just standing, right? We're just standing here and you can see, you can see that that's, that's the air that these children are breathing. And, and then if you track it back, where did the garbage come from? And who, you know, so asking the question of, who um, who bears the burden and who reaps the benefit of the modern industrial society, and and to me that that's the big question for environmental justice, and that's the question for me for the book. And I would add a little, uh, just a little additional frame to what Peggy just said because it's beautiful. Who bears the burden of middle class comfort? Yeah, yeah, and for white privilege. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you could even tweak that sentence to who bears the so this, burden my question of white is a little suburban bit. middle class comfort. Yeah, right. I'm really curious about the people of faith part of the title and the book, which which I will admit I have not read. So this is a really ignorant question. But having worked in DC, those silo, silos that Manish named are so real. So here's the environmental group, here's the, and there were always, the whole time I was there, there were these scrappy grassroots people of color trying to get the attention of the national scene. And it's like, where do they try to get it in that siloed, very race and class driven system? Um, which is partly why I left DC. But I, but I wonder about how people of faith and intersectionality can, um, can go together when we get over ourselves a little bit. Um, because to me, people of faith is kind of, you know, human rights is a huge umbrella, but people of faith is also just a huge umbrella that that to me being faithful includes many, many things. And I'm, I'm curious how that played in with you, with the authors, how this impacts, you know, on a faith level. Um, so I think, I mean, one of the first things that's coming to me is that from the perspective of spirituality and faith, um, who do, what does our spiritual framing and our, um, spiritual lens and grounding, who does it include and who does it exclude? What does it include? What does it exclude? Um, you know, we have our, our, our UU principles are beautiful and we each have different ways of interpreting and understanding them. So this, this, the material in this particular book and the kind of framing of it is an invitation to kind of look at, um, at that grounding, at that interpretation, at that lens and analysis and to move deeper into it. Um, it's kind of an invitation to greater expansiveness. So, you know, uh, with the spirit, I, I work with a variety of spiritual teachers. And uh, one of the things I often hear is that uh, we can be in a, in a frame of mind that is contractive. So that's that, that's that um, uh, win lose situation that if my issue is getting more attention, um, your issue is probably not getting as much attention. So somebody wins, somebody loses. But from a place of deeper spiritual expansiveness, we can see that coming together, being more inclusive, being 
um, more inclusive as to what is holding our attention, what we're caring about, what we're trying to impact. Greater expansiveness makes us more impactful, and it's also a deeper spiritual grounding. It's both of those things at the same time. Yeah, I appreciate that. I appreciate the, the depth and the reality of that. And it, it feels like a lot of the stuff we get into with the stupid competitions and silos and turfs is if we could deepen in, we would say, none, none of that is actually relevant to life. N none of that actually, like Michael said, when you, none of us live in an identity. You know, everybody here and everyone else I've ever met has multiple complex identities. Um, so, yeah, it's interesting. Can I can I ask yeah. another sort of student studenty type question? <laughs> um, I'm curious about the relationship between, um, you know, being siloed and um, but also going deep into something because um, it seems to me that there is something that happens when you go deep into something where you discover the intersectionality in, in the depth. And so, and that's different than um, being siloed. And so I just w wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. Uh, go ahead, Manish. No, okay. Peggy, go ahead, I'll add, yeah. So one of the things for me, um, so, you know, if you think of sort of all these little flowers on the top and then all the roots that go down and all the roots that are really connected, for me, the deeper I go, the more what I'm seeing isn't, it's intersectional, but really it's interdependent. It's ways that we are profoundly connected to each other. So that while it may feel like an issue, you know, this is the issue and then there's another issue over here, there is no way to fully address any of the issues without recognizing that they are dependent on each other. So, you know, if we're looking at um, some, my kind of, the lens I often use is around food. And if we're looking at, um, you know, what am I eating? So I'm making this choice, but there are a lot of people who pay for my choice all along the way that go you know, further and further and farther and farther away from where I am. And the same with, with say garbage, you know, so I, I throw something away or even I choose to buy something that's in plastic. I'm making a choice that has affected so many people behind me and then so many people in the environment in, in front of me. So for me, it's more that when you go deep, you find that we are really all, our roots are kind of feeding off of the same underground stream. And that when we we sit trying to be fully awake to it, to all of it, what we're finding is um, is real connection and a, a desperate need for us to recognize how everything we do really is connected to and has impact on everyone else. I love that answers your question. <laughs> it is. It does. It does. I mean, I think. Um you know, it's um, the, the, the question of being kind of a, um, a justice sort of generalist um, and, and being a, um, someone who's invested in something deeply is not a question, I think, of being invested in your issue deeply necessarily, but in, in something else. And I'm, I don't have the language for that, but um, some you're invested in some other piece deeply that is um, interdependent. I think, Jessica, what, what you're describing is um, a shared ministry, right? Um, and intersectionality, I, I look at it in many of the same ways and models that we look at uh, shared ministry. So in shared ministry, um, you know, religious educator doesn't need to be doing um, the same work that the lead minister or ordained clergy need to be doing, but we have an understanding of each other's work and we have a depth of, it, of knowledge and expertise in our own that is valued and um, recognized by the other. And that, that value and recognition leads to the collaboration, which produces 
that which is larger than the, than each of the individuals. And so when I look at the intersectionality of our, our social justice, racial justice work, I look at it from that, that, you know, when we're doing shared ministry, we're, we're taking those silos and recognizing those silos, but also recognizing the expertise that people have within those and then um, breaking down those silos so that we can be collaborative across them. Um, not necessarily that we become the expert in everything that I can do, what um, the religious educator can do, that the ordained clergy person can do, but that where there is a shared respect um, and acknowledgement for where those things are different. Um, and and I, that's the way I see the intersectionality of 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 uh, what Manish and, and um, Jennifer and, and um, Peggy have brought is um, that understanding of those different um, levels of expertise and acknowledgement, and then the collaboration between those. That's really where, to me, I get you know super excited and get all the feels and start bouncing up and down in my chair. Is that I don't I, I tell folks you know, this all the time who ask me, you know, why don't you do more racial justice work or um, uh, environmental justice work? Like, you know, it's just, I, I, that is not where my ministry calls me to. I deeply respect the work that environmental justice folks are doing. And I don't feel like I need to be the expert in that. I need to know who those folks are so that we can be um, in relationship and, and moving through those, some of those, the, some of those, all of the intersectional ways in which those occur, but um, I, I don't want to have to be um, an expert in all of those different things. I, I want people to be drawn to their ministries and uh, where they're called, and, and my my theological framework called to by by God or the universe, um, and and see the beauty and recognize the beauty in what they're doing, um, and, and hope that that's reciprocal. Oh, it's turning into a cosmic meditation here. I love it. Manish, you trying to talk and be muted or are you doing something else there? Okay. Um, because of what I was thinking is the difference between that point of view and a point of view that permeates many congregations and many of the silos we've talked about, which is this idea that there is a pure environmentalism that is only concerned, you know, with I don't know, the ether at a certain level or something, I don't even know, but, but the, the racist history of the environmental movement is not a small history. And um, the, the conflict between especially indigenous rights and environmentalists is just legendary all over the world. And I wonder, Peggy, if you wanted to speak to that and, and if you see that the mainstream environmentalists are waking up the way that some white people are waking up to that history and legacy of white supremacy? That's a good question. Um, and I want to say kind of, <laughs> not, you know, in, in some ways, um, the mainstream, like some of the big names, I think of someone like Bill McKibben, he, he's getting it. He completely, he really understands um, intersectionality and then and there are organizations like you know NRDC who also really get it uh, I think the Sierra Club is sort of shifting and trying to get it um, but I wouldn't say that it's it's the norm even in those organizations I wouldn't say it's the norm I would say that they're 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 starting to understand that maybe there are other ways of looking at it but I would say that what they see is more of a um, more about like, you know, communities of color are impacted more, right? And they would kind of recognize that. What they don't see is how, you know, systems of dominance have created, so that communities of color are affected more is like at the end of a long process of the systems of dominance that have been put in place so that we value some life more than other life. And that leads us to a place where, you know, you could make that conclusion. But I haven't seen in mainstream environmentalism a willingness to untangle the system. 
that brings us to where we are. I see some environmentalists who are willing to name some of those issues that are starting to talk about that. But um, I don't even know how many environmental justice workers are talking about about systems of dominance, really. I mean, it's sort of, we in some way keep addressing impact and we aren't addressing cause too deeply yet on a massive scale. It looks like Manish wants, I don't want to keep talking. <laughs> right, and which, I was, which com, some communities are valued more than other communities and who, who lives in those communities and who doesn't, you know, the, the, so what we're dealing with is the after, the after effects or the ultimate impacts of decades of decisions that have valued some communities more than other communities. And the pattern has been that it is wealthier, almost always Caucasian American or white communities um, that have ensured politically that waste treatment facilities and incinerators and power plants, et cetera, et cetera, are not cited anywhere near um, communities that where where that are 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 that where there has been a desire to value those communities and preserve housing prices and preserve wealth um, and health and not impact the health of those particular children, and so um, these facilities have gotten cited in communities that may be less politically um, impactful. Those are often communities um, in which um, folks on the margins are living um, that may not have as many financial resources to, to hire lobbyists to fight um, the decisions to cite these plants and those facilities. And so we now have these end results that it, they are disproportionate impacts. And, um, and it is systems of, of power and privilege that have led to that outcome. And now what we're dealing with is, this, is similar systems of power and privilege in, kind of embedded in the way we think that keep us from even being able to wrap our head around the nature of the problem that exists. So the, the win-lose paradigm, that's a majority culture kind of Western-ish framework, right? So if we were to look at other um, uh, cultures uh, in which people of color are, are frequently rooted, it's a far different ethos. You know, I am embedded in, in a um, Lakota uh, practice community based in New Mexico, and it is all about community. It is all about communal impact and communal relationship and interdependence. And um, it is not about the win lose is about the community and the planet. Is the planet and the community as a whole are we all expanding and doing better together, or are we all contracting and shrinking and doing harm to one another? Um, that's if any if if there's any kind of thinking along those lines, it's at that level. It's not about individual that I must preserve my little neighborhood, and and you can do whatever you want to somebody. But um, it's it's so there are dominant patterns of thinking that have already led to the outcomes, and then we have to kind of overcome those dominant patterns of thinking within our own congregations and communities to even begin tackling. The, the the realities that we have today. I was looking at a map of Superfund sites in the state of New Jersey. And if you overlay it to low income households, right, and you can see how many Superfund sites are in low income neighborhoods. But if you overlay it with communities of color, it is stunning that really, it's not about, about income, it really is about race, that poor white neighborhoods don't have the same number of Superfund sites as communities of color, wealthy communities of color, even through the whole state. It's so clearly, um, we make these choices, and I completely agree with, with Manish, we have these um, patterns of thinking that allow us not only to make those choices, but to live with them. We just communally have accepted that that's the way that it is. And for me, the challenge is, since so much of this really, I think is unconscious, the challenge is bringing this up to people's consciousness, the choices that we make, the impact that they make. And then, you know, deeper than that, within an individual person, what is it that you're valuing? What are you devaluing? You know, I mean, 
I see the same thing in um, in what we call construction or what I call destruction. When we kind of look at, at the woods and people look and say, well, there's nothing there. So we can, let's build a new supermarket because there's nothing here. And I look at it and say, well, there are hundreds of trees. There are countless species. Something is there. We, we do that with communities of color too, that that's irrelevant. There's nothing there. So we can just build this plant here because it doesn't matter. So those are the, the thought processes that the undoing, the deep undoing that has to happen. And I, I think our congregations are a great place to start is at least people in the room who are willing to ask the questions. Well, I think one of the big gifts of this book is challenging that paradigm and, and was a really big, you know, awakening, awakening for me while reading it um, of that idea of the sanitized wilderness, you know, I mean, not everybody loves Thoreau, but like that idea of, you know, the, the white man out in the wilderness all by himself, pristine is not actually environmentalism that, that works for people anymore and works for our planet and um, how we need to challenge that paradigm and how it's really embedded in UUism so deeply that it's, it is hard work. Well, and if we think about what Peggy said about the systems of dominance and connect the dots, it's really fundamentally about what and who and who is important here get used as commodities for the creation of wealth that only a very few people have access to. Mm -hmm. um, because, you know, and, and, and as we dehumanize people based on race, for example, we um, allow the system to continue that turns people of color into commodities. Um, I mean, you know, we thought, we think we've abolished slavery um, because we don't like actually sell people anymore. Um, and maybe, you know, we really haven't abolished that, that way of thinking. And, and, and to piggyback on that, Michael, I think it's also who makes those decisions. 